At Digital Science, we believe that the best research is done collaboratively, and that is a value that the MRC's Laboratory of Molecular Biology also hold close to their hearts, as evidenced by the fact that they've created a whole bunch of groundbreaking research and produced a bunch of Nobel Prize winners. We're joined by one such Nobel Prize winner today, Venki Ramakrishnan. Ramakrishnan, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm wondering, can we start with a, a pretty tricky question, given the, the breadth of your research career and all the amazing things that you've, got, that you've done? Can you tell me a little bit about you, your background and your research? Yeah. So I, I grew up in India and uh, stayed there until I got a degree in physics. And then at the age of 19, I left to go to Ohio University in the U.S., uh, it's in southeastern Ohio, uh, to get a PhD in physics. And I finished my first two years of coursework and then started doing uh, a PhD research under a supervisor, uh, Tomoyasu Tanaka. And I was working on theoretical condensed matter physics. And soon after I started doing my thesis work, I realized uh, I wasn't actually... Uh, so interested in that particular problem. And it wasn't clear what I would do uh, as a physicist. I didn't have a good sense. Uh, but, I, but at the same time, I would read Scientific American and other uh, magazines and books and realize that biology was in a, a, ter a terrific state. It was, it was making dramatic advances. Uh, and... And which continues to till today, actually. Mm -hmm. And I knew many physicists had made this transition, but I didn't know any biology. So after my PhD, I decided to go to graduate school again uh, at the University of California in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was actually worse than just going to graduate school because in the first two weeks of my new second graduate school, this time in biology, I realized I didn't understand anything that the professors uh, were saying in their survey lectures. Mm -hmm. You know, graduate students are given uh, a survey lecture of research going on in the department or in the university, actually. Mm -hmm. And I realized I didn't understand any of the terms they were using. So I actually spent the first year taking undergraduate courses. Uh, so I'd gone after a PhD right back to undergraduate mm -hmm. courses in biology. And I think that helped provide me a foundation mm -hmm. uh, for uh, doing research in biology. And then in my second year, I started doing research in biology, but by then I'd acquired enough of a background and learned how to do lab work. Mm -hmm. and it, you know, it was the first time I was doing experimental work. And um, I came across another article, and this one was on the ribosome. Uh, which is this large complex that translates genetic information. And it was written by two people at Yale. And so I wrote to them, and uh, one thing led to another, and I ended up doing a postdoc at Yale. And that's what got me into my current line of research, which has you know, now lasted over 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, I've been a sort of ribosome biologist ever since. Mm -hmm. And that's actually something that you, you, you won the Nobel Prize in chemistry for your work on better understanding the ribosome with, with a couple of other collaborators as well. Can you tell me I wouldn't a call them bit... collaborators. That's a... Yeah. A, you know, and one of them was actually a, a, a competitor Ooh. with whom I had, you know, very little to uh, was exchange. that Thomas or was that Ada? No, it was Ada Yona. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, tell us a little bit more about that because we do well, you know, research. I, you know, tell us about the kind of the, the competitive nature. Does it drive you on or is well, it a challenge? I think competition, I, I like to say it's good for science but bad for scientists <laughs> because it's, it's quite stressful. But on the other hand, it makes you work very hard also think very hard and and uh, so on. I'm, I'm now reading a book about uh, the Manhattan Project. Uh -huh. uh, you know, it's a fantastic book by Richard Rhodes. It was published about 30 or 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. 
And, uh, you know, perhaps because this movie Oppenheimer came, came out, but Oppenheimer is only one element of a vast enterprise. Yeah. And what strikes me is these people were terribly afraid that the Germans were going to get the bomb before them. Mm. And it just made them work ferociously. Mm. You know, so I think competition does spur you on and does, you know, make science advance much faster. Mm. Just like in business, you wouldn't want monopolies, you know, you you want, uh, or you wouldn't want cartels, which yeah. is what a collaboration would be, that yeah. they're all, you know, uh, collaborating to, to set yeah. prices, for example. Yeah. Uh, so, you, 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 do, you know, competition is good in business. It's also good in science. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, many kinds of science require collaboration. Mm. For example, the Human Genome Project, when it was first done, was a collaboration, uh, you know, transatlantic mm-hmm. collaboration, actually. And, uh, you know, things like, uh, you know, gravitational waves or the discovery of the Higgs boson yeah. involve hundreds of people and maybe thousands. And so there, there are kinds of science that require real collaboration mm. and others uh, don't mm. and others are small scale collaborations where you collaborate with someone who has a complementary expertise mm. uh, to what you have and others are what I call fun collaborations you collaborate because you like the other person and it's more fun to work together you can cheer each other up when things are not working and so, yeah. so, so I think collaboration has uh, many different there are many different kinds, but science, you know, we often talk about diversity, but science needs diverse ways of doing it as well. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, some science is very individualistic, mm-hmm. done by lone scientists thinking really hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, you need that. Yeah. Uh, everything can't be done as a group or by committee. And uh, you also need, you know, these large-scale collaboration. It's really interesting. It makes me think of... The space race being one example of how competition really drove progress forward, progress we still encounter on an almost daily basis in our lives, you know, by the developments that came from all of those different discoveries of materials or ways of doing things or manufacture, whatever that may be. But then you look at something like the discovery of the, the vaccines, the mRNA vaccines around COVID, for example, and it was this focused collaborative effort to solve one massive global challenge i was chatting sure, to my uber there was, driver there was yesterday. competition there too there was competition among vaccine companies yep. to yep. try and get their vaccine out first yeah. and it's interesting you know a vaccine that came in third even though it was really a very good vaccine mm-hmm. uh, didn't get much traction mm-hmm. simply because it wasn't first to market yeah you know yeah. So, so I, I think there are, um, even in even in there, there was there yeah. was competition that spurred things yeah. on. I think it's really interesting. You talk about the different ways of doing things as well, the, the diversity of the process of research. We chatted to somebody called Courtney Hone, who is I, I call her the mother of moonshots, and she's one of the people that helped really build X, the moonshot factory, over in California, and she is a big advocate for actually not racing to market necessarily because being the first can sometimes pay off, but actually being the better option can pay off in the longer term. And so really taking time to nurture ideas can sometimes be what you need as well. I really like the diversity of doing things. It's a lovely way to see it. Can you tell me a little bit more about ribosomes? For a humble chemist like me that does not know much about biology but can just about understand a protein, why are ribosomes so fundamental? Why do we need to understand how they work? And if we understand how they work, what can we do with that? Well, first of all, my research has been mostly driven by curiosity (laughs) rather than about, you know, what what could we necessarily do with it. Mm -hmm. But um, I should say... Ribosomes are absolutely fundamental. They're, if you look at what our genes are, our genes are basically information on how to make proteins, not entirely, because mm-hmm. some genes uh, code for RNA, mm-hmm. and RNA 
molecules themselves have there are RNA molecules which have their own roles to play mm -hmm. uh, but uh, and we can get, discuss that later if you like but many genes code in, have contain information on how to make proteins mm -hmm. and that information is copied to an intermediary molecule called messenger RNA or mRNA which is what these vaccines uh, many of these vaccines are and the mRNA is actually read by this large molecular complex mm -hmm. called the ribosome. Mm -hmm. And what the ribosome does is it reads the genetic instructions. Mm -hmm. That is the string of bases that form mm -hmm. the mRNA, which is really a copy of the string of bases mm -hmm. on one of the strands of DNA. Mm -hmm. And it, it reads that string of instructions. And according to those instructions, it stitches together a protein from its building blocks, which are amino acids. And the miraculous thing about proteins, it's not mir miraculous, it's all chemistry, but um, is that based on the sequence of amino acids that make up the protein, which is dictated by the genetic sequence, the protein folds up into its mm -hmm. characteristic shape, and that characteristic shape gives it its function. Mm -hmm. And so ribosomes are right at the crossroads between genes and the products that genes specify. Mm -hmm. And it's all these thousands of proteins that we have in our body, uh, which are made from the thousands of genes that encode them, that we function. Mm -hmm. So genes are responsible for the very fact that you can see me is because of a protein uh, in your eye called rhodopsin. Mm -hmm. Uh, the fact that you can take in oxygen and use it and distribute the oxygen to your tissues mm -hmm. is due to a protein called hemoglobin, which is what gives blood its, its red color. Mm -hmm. And uh, our skin and connective tissue is made of a long filamentous protein called collagen. Mm -hmm. And so you, I'm just giving an antibodies are made of proteins. Yeah. So just to show you the diversity of proteins that make up life, mm -hmm. And every one of them is made by the ribosome. Mm. So the ribosome is absolutely fundamental to biology. Yeah, it's brilliant. I mean, I, hearing about your story and reflecting on what you said about how you, you explored something that you were curious about. You didn't think so much about the, the impact or the longer term ripple effect it would have on, on the rest of biology, on the rest of sort of scientific understanding. It reminds me a little bit of another Nobel Prize winner, actually, Harry Croto, who, when he was working on Buckminster Fullerene and Buckyballs, he struggled a little bit at one point to get you know, a, a faculty position because the work he was doing was interesting, but because that application couldn't be demonstrated, there was a bit of reluctance. And I think we see that perhaps these days as well as we need to declare potential impact for the research that we're doing when we apply for funding. Can you, can you relate to any of those challenges or struggles? What do you think about? Well, do we I've, give research I've been very space? lucky. I, I, I've been in positions where, um, you know, mostly research positions, except for a brief stint at the University of Utah, uh, which is the only time I've been a professor mm -hmm. um, uh, and where I was a faculty member and uh, the School of Medicine, mm. the biochemistry department there. But but university, so the NIH in the U.S. is very, very broad-minded. Mm -hmm. uh, it realizes that basic research is fundamental to tackling disease. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, we've made tremendous advances in cancer mm -hmm. treatment, but that rests on understanding all of the fundamental biology of the cell, how is, you know, what is the uh, way in which genes are regulated and they're expressed and how does this whole process go awry mm -hmm. in cancer and what are some of the things that have to happen uh, for a cancer cell to actually mm -hmm. take off and, and produce cancer in the individual. All of that rests on a lot of fundamental biology. Yeah. And I think the, here in Britain, the Medical Research Council, at least historically, mm -hmm. uh, has... Uh, taken a similarly broad view. Mm -hmm. In fact, this lab, which is 
was founded by the Medical Research Council and still uh, one of the, you know, is one of the big, biggest institutions still directly uh, mm -hmm. funded by the MRC, uh, is based on uh, fundamental research. And yet, the uh, slight irony is that the LMB has produced more wealth uh, in t you know, than almost any other biological institution mm -hmm. uh, because this is a place where sequencing was discovered. This is a place where uh, protein structure determination was uh, developed first by x-rays, you know, 60, 70 years ago, and more recently by cryo-EM. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's where monoclonal antibodies uh, were discovered. And monoclonal antibodies are a multi-billion dollar business uh, in the world today. So, uh, and you know, six of the top 10 10 drugs in the world are monoclonal antibodies, yeah. and we're finding in increasingly new uses for monoclonal antibodies. But all of that came out of fundamental research. Mm. So I think if you were to put a value on fundamental research, the value would be enormous, mm -hmm. far more than directed research. Mm -hmm. Because while directed research can improve things in a field that's already known, mm -hmm. fundamental research can break open entirely new fields and create revolutionary new applications. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that I think uh, isn't made often enough. Yeah. How do you think in the current framework of research, how can we ensure that we make space for those kinds of discoveries? I think governments need to realize that you need to nurture fundamental research uh, and they need to spend, agree to spend a certain fraction of their budget mm. on, you know, high quality, uh, really pushing the envelope kind of mm -hmm. fundamental research. Mm. Some of it could be very high risk mm -hmm. and, and things that are not likely to pay off. Mm. But if they did, they would open up entirely uh, new fields. Mm. But of course, ultimately, the taxpayer is funding science only partly out of curiosity. It's also partly because they feel that science can lead to uh, better technologies, mm. better medicine, improve their general uh, well-being and, mm -hmm. and quality of life. And so we have to respect that because it is money coming from the taxpayer. Yeah. So, uh, so, of course, research councils and funding agencies also need to fund uh, directed mm -hmm. research. They need to fund applied research. They also need to make it easier for uh, scientists and entrepreneurs to be able to take fundamental discoveries mm -hmm. and be able to translate them uh, yeah. into start in startup companies and 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 nurture the whole uh, ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can't neglect you know the the seed corn, mm -hmm. which is what fundamental research is. Yeah. And you can't artificially force people uh, to write up bogus <laughs> impact statements. You know, yes. this is just a kind of dishonesty, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, you know, people should fund fundamental research for its own sake. I think that's absolutely right. We were chatting about this at a conference, an unconference recently on science and social science. And this is one of the really big things that, that came up. You talk about the, the challenge of translating research. We know there is so much valuable information out there that sits on the metaphoric lab shelf and does not get used appropriately, partly because it's not being exposed to the right people, partly because funding models at the moment won't allow for the next step of research. Do you think for the fundamental research and maybe for the translation of research, could you see more collaboration between maybe academia and industry? Could that be one way to overcome I think you need to change this? the whole culture. Yes. And, <laughs> and, and the reason is, I mean, if you look at uh, the Bay Area or Boston, mm -hmm. you don't see this barrier. Mm -hmm. You you see uh, professors who are doing great fundamental work and very easily, you know, starting up companies or sometimes their postdocs will go off mm -hmm. into industry and startup companies, uh, and and it's all around them. So uh, the, this this transition or this this transfer mm -hmm. of information 
is both frequent and, and, and seemingly effortless. Mm -hmm. Now, I think until a few decades ago, I'm afraid British academia had a certain snobbery <laughs> that, oh, you know, we, we're not tainted by money and we, we're pure mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And, and it's only recently uh, that it's changed. But now, you know, I, I think even in Britain, uh, there's tremendous entrepreneurship. But one problem is that young people, especially graduate students and postdocs, are not exposed enough to, to industry, mm -hmm. to startups, to entrepreneurship. The only role models they see are academics. Mm -hmm. So they think that that's the default career option. They don't, this, the entrepreneurship idea isn't inculcated in them from a very early mm -hmm. stage. Then they become slowly aware of it and, and they sometimes see it as an option if academia doesn't work out, which is the wrong way to look at mm -hmm. it. You know, it should be an equal option depending on their uh, particular interest and aptitude. And Absolutely. So I think um, it. I think it was actually the Royal Society. You were, a, you know, you were a former president of the Royal Society, and I think it was one of your reports that showcased just the the stark numbers of people that actually stay within a, a research and an academic research career versus the number that start, and it really tails off so quickly. But I do think you're right. At the moment, we tend to expose researchers, whether they're PhD students, postdocs, to this idea and the training regime that will train them to become academic researchers. And we train them in very little else at the moment. Do you think that needs to change? Because the bulk of research does happen outside of academia. All of these amazing graduates go on to have influence in a range of different careers. What yeah. do you think we need to do? I, I, wouldn't, tr I wouldn't train them differently <laughs> because you do need that very rigorous mm -hmm. training in, in, in doing science and doing research. And, and mm -hmm. that's going to serve you well, uh, whether you're in academia or industry. Mm -hmm. you, if, whether you're in, in, mm -hmm. in industry, you still have to do uh, essentially rigorous science and rigorous uh, research. So I wouldn't necessarily change the training but what I would do is is expose them more uh, to alternatives uh, and expose them more to possibilities in entrepreneurship so that they're constantly uh, their mind is open to other possibilities and it's not just uh, entrepreneurship there are other careers in science the pub there's public engagement there's policy science policy uh, there's work in government, uh, international organizations, science organizations, uh, publishing. So there are many careers in, in science. And I think it would be useful to have either workshops or people just coming and giving talks mm -hmm. about all of these alternatives so that people are generally aware. Mm -hmm. But in the end, it's go only going to change if if we build up broad ecosystems around mm -hmm. academic centers. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what the U.S. has done very well, and mm -hmm. Israel is another example mm -hmm. uh, of a place that's done really well. Uh, other places that have done it well are places like Singapore. Mm -hmm. And I was impressed that in China now, there are lots of incubators and startups embedded within university uh, campuses. And so that then exposes people who are uh, students or postdocs to that ecosystem mm -hmm. around them. And, and I think that's a way to have it happen naturally. Yeah. That's really interesting. I um, So I, I wanted to maybe touch on, again, your role as president of the Royal Society, because these interdisciplinary societies that do engage with researchers, with policymakers of industry, could provide, you know, and I think do provide that fundamental platform on which to have that, that cross-segment engagement. Do you think we need more of that? And how and can we can we utilize those societies better? Can we engage with them more as researchers? Well, you know, societies like the Royal Society can play a, a leadership role by bringing together different segments of the scientific community. 
uh, you know, government, industry, academia, other, and you know, others. But um, I think ultimately it's going to require a, a large scale change. Now, the thing that's happened in Britain in the last few decades is uh, we now have uh, lots of entrepreneurship around, for example, in Cambridge has a number of science parks. Mm -hmm. uh, one difference between Cambridge and say Boston mm -hmm. is that in Boston, a huge amount of startups and industry are concentrated within a one square mile mm -hmm. in Kendall Square yeah. around MIT. So you, you, you leave your MIT building and you're in the middle of it all right mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think one problem with Cambridge is that it's it's a bit spread out. Mm -hmm. You have the science park in the north, and then you have a bunch of science park, but they're all you know several miles or mm -hmm. sometimes many miles away from each other, and you have to drive to get there. Uh, mm -hmm. They're not sort of within walking distance. So I think you know mm -hmm. it'd be good to have a concentration of startups around academic mm -hmm. centers. Mm -hmm within walking distance, within, uh, you know, so that they can all communicate mm. very easily with each other. And I think that's the kind of thing that uh, can really change, mm. change people's perception mm -hmm. about opportunities, about career paths. Mm -hmm. Yeah. May I ask you something that I certainly will never experience. And so I'd love to hear what this was like for you. You won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. Very few people will ever win a Nobel Prize. Can you share with us what that experience was like for you? How you found out what that felt like? How did you celebrate? Well, it's funny because people think of the Nobel Prize as a thing, but it doesn't just happen. It's it's often the culmination of lots of other things. For example, you get elected to your uh, National Academy. Uh, you get other awards, which are often run-ups to the uh, Nobel Prize. Uh, it's a bit like, you know, you have the Golden Globes yeah. or the BAFTAs, and then, you know, end up with the Oscars or something. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think, you know, this whole thing uh, create, creates a sort of sports mentality to science. You know, it, it treats science as if it's some sort of sporting competition. Uh, but, you know, in, in, in sports, you can measure in a 100-meter race who came first, who came second, who came third. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's very, very, uh, the difference is very small, but mm -hmm. it, at least you can measure it. And there's, a, and there's also a rule for how you measure it. Mm -hmm. And but in science, it isn't like that, you know. So science is multidimensional, uh, and it's not often straightforward to say, "Oh, these are the top three who mm -hmm. did it," because they contributed in di often contributed in different ways. Mm -hmm. There may be other people who made different contributions, and also these three people's contributions often rests on other people's uh, mm. contributions. So I'm a little, although I've benefited enormously from the prize in terms of visibility and so on. You probably wouldn't be interviewing me today if I didn't have one. Uh, so uh, although I, I, I did benefit a lot from it, uh, I, I do think it creates a slightly false impression uh, mm -hmm. about science. The one good thing you can say is that maybe it draws attention to science. At least the Nobels have enough visibility that once a year people pay some attention mm. uh, to fundamental. Mm -hmm. And also the Nobel doesn't care about whether it's applied or fundamental, mm. uh, its discovery. It, it's been awarded for very basic discoveries uh, for much of its, mm -hmm. most of its career. Mm -hmm. And so it does, um, you know, give the public a sense of what science is about. So mm -hmm. that's probably the one good thing. Mm -hmm. But it has some very negative aspects in terms of uh, we talked about competition earlier. People mm -hmm. are instinctively competitive anyway, and, and awards make it even worse. Yeah. That's really interesting, actually. And I, I like that you sort of told that story of the, the snowball effect almost, you know, the, the BAFTAs, yeah. the Golden Globes, the, the ultimate yeah. Oscars. Yeah, so, so to science. get back to your thing, yeah. uh, the, the, back, get back to your original question, 
there were a number of awards for the ribosome, and most of them uh, went to other people and not to me. Wow. And so, I, and and I also had an altercation with a Swedish uh, scientist who was a ribosome scientist, very, very good scientist. But we didn't agree on a particular aspect of how the ribosome <laughs> works. And uh, it turned out he was appointed to the Nobel Committee. So I simply, you know, in my mind, I dismissed the idea that I would ever get it because, you know, these run-up awards often went to other people. So I thought, well, the community doesn't think I'm in the same class as these other people. And, you know, that might be disappointing, but, you know, that's that's life. And um, and then there was this other weird occurrence of this altercation. And so I, I was very surprised uh, to receive that phone call that day. In fact, I didn't quite believe it. I thought it was some sort of prank. Oh, my and, God. And, and, of course, that turns out not to be an uncommon reaction, apparently. But, uh, anyway, that's how I felt. Wow. So do you you had an inkling and that it, it may happen? Oh, I, I thought the ribosome was a very good candidate for the mm -hmm. Nobel Prize, but it's restricted to three people. And so it wasn't at all clear that I would be one of the three since many of these other awards for the ribosome had gone to mm. uh, other people. And, you know, there, there are the very formal things that then happen. You will have interviews, you will have to attend press conferences, you will yeah. go to certain ceremonies. How did you, Venki, the physicist turned biologist, now Nobel Prize winning, you know, chemist, how did you celebrate? How do you celebrate something like that? Well, the LMB has a tradition. You know, they have a, a, a champagne party uh, on the on the uh, afternoon of the award announcement. So the entire LMB gathered up in the canteen on the yeah. top floor of the. It wasn't this building; it was the old building. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, so it was, it was kind kind of fun to for everybody to have a good time. And one thing about the LMB I like is because it's block funded. Mm -hmm. There is, it doesn't have these turf wars and internecine mm. rivalries that often characterize many academic institutions. Uh, because if somebody does well, it's good for the LMB. So the LMB gets, yeah. you know, more secure funding. And it's good for everybody. Yeah. So we take pleasure in each other's uh, successes, and, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, that attitude was really brought out in these. Uh, Nobel celebrations. You know, the LMB has won uh, many Nobel Prizes, and each time there's a sort of lab wide mm. celebration. I love that. The idea of all these Nobel laureates going, oh, we've got another one, everyone. This is great. <laughs> but it just goes to show the productivity of this kind of setup, this different yeah. way of doing research. Yeah, and of course, you know, the Nobel Prize is not a it's not a goal of the lab. We could, you know, the lab went, uh, once went, to, I think almost 20 years without one, uh -huh. okay? And uh, it didn't matter. The, the point is that the LMB likes to support challenging fundamental problems, and the Nobel Prizes are an occasional byproduct mm -hmm. uh, of that way of doing science. Yeah, brilliant. I'm going to wrap up with one final question. If you had a magic wand and you could do one thing to make research even better, what would you choose to do? What would you choose to change? That's, that's very hard <laughs> to answer. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think if you look at how amazingly well science is done, mm -hmm. and you know the, the progress in just the last century alone is just astonishing. Mm -hmm. And the number of scientists has grown, the whole enterprise has grown, uh, discoveries are being made at an increasingly rapid pace. So I'm not sure, you know, what else we could, maybe we're doing a lot of things mm. right. Yeah. And, and that's why it's working. And, and of course, we always want things to be better. So we're always complaining. Yeah. But, but I'm not sure that, I, I don't, I'm not one of those people who feels that science is broken. I, I see young people doing, you know, brilliant science mm. uh, all over the world and science flourishing in many different countries, uh, increasing number of countries. Uh, so I, I think, you know, maybe we should be thinking about improving humanity and avoiding wars and, and 
you know, social injustices and things like that. I think those are more pressing problems than uh, you know, changing science. Or... I think that's a perfect way to wrap this interview. Thank you, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate your time.